After studying this module, you will learn about the mechanism and causes of the greenhouse effect, know about global warming and why mitigation is important, learn about the phenomenon of acid rain and its sources, know the effects of acid rain on plant and animal life and how it can be prevented. Greenhouse effect. Most of you must be familiar with the term global warming. Global warming is basically the alteration in global temperature due to the excessive presence of some species in the atmosphere. In this module, we'll discuss the term global warming and how it is related to the term greenhouse effect. What is greenhouse effect? Let's have a look at that. The greenhouse effect is the natural heating of the Earth's surface. When energy from the sun reaches the Earth's atmosphere, some of it gets reflected back into space and the rest is absorbed by greenhouse gases. These include carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane and nitrous oxide. The gases transmit short wavelength radiation from the sun and absorb long wavelength infrared radiation emitted by the earth. The absorbed energy warms the surface of the earth and the atmosphere maintaining the temperature about 33 degrees Celsius higher than it would have been in the absence of this effect. Thus this phenomenon makes life on earth possible. This is the natural greenhouse effect. Now let's have a look at how human activities have enhanced the greenhouse effect. Human activities such as burning of fossil fuels which include coal, oil and natural gas, some agricultural practices, land clearing and industrial activities etc are responsible for increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases beyond their natural levels. Also in addition to the natural greenhouse gases, for example water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane whose concentrations have increased due to industrial activity in recent times, the artificial compounds chlorofluorocarbons also known as the CFCs and also tropospheric ozone added by human activity contribute to enhanced greenhouse effect. This in turn results in excessive warming of the earth by increasing its average temperature beyond natural levels. This phenomenon is called global warming and the resulting aberrations in global climate are collectively referred to as climate change. You can see in the figure shown here the difference between the natural greenhouse effect and the human enhanced greenhouse effect. Radiative forcing. This is a term radiative forcing which is defined by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change also known as IPCC as a measure of the influence a factor has in altering the balance of incoming and outgoing energy in the earth atmosphere system and is an index of the importance of the factor as a potential climate change mechanism. For greenhouse gases, radiative forcing may be measured as the amount of heat measured in watts a greenhouse gas imparts to a square meter of earth. The radiative forcing exerted by each greenhouse gas depends on its concentration and its ability to absorb long wavelength infrared radiation. Carbon dioxide contributes most to the greenhouse effect calculated in this manner. Historical background. Let's have a brief look into the history of greenhouse effect. Scientists have known about the greenhouse effect since 1824 when Joseph Fourier calculated that the earth would be much colder if it had no atmosphere. He named this process greenhouse effect on the basis of earlier work by Swiss naturalist de Saussure who had demonstrated that the temperature inside a glass box exposed to the sun was higher than that outside. In 1838, Claude Pulot, a French physicist, attributed the natural greenhouse effect to water vapor and carbon dioxide. He concluded that any variation in the quantity of water vapor or of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
should result in a climate change. In 1860, optical and radiative properties of the atmospheric gases were studied by John Tyndall, an Irish physicist, who confirmed that most of the greenhouse effect is due to molecules of water vapor and carbon dioxide. In 1895, the Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius, better known for his ionic equilibria studies, calculated that a doubling of carbon dioxide in the air will lead to a global increase of 4 degrees Celsius of the ground temperature and predicted as a consequence that the industrial age will generate a global warming effect. He could be considered a pioneer in climate research that has given us a sophisticated understanding of global warming. In 1917, Alexander Graham Bell wrote, the unchecked burning of fossil fuels would have a sort of greenhouse effect and the net result is the greenhouse becomes a sort of hothouse. Bell went on to advocate for the use of alternative energy sources such as solar energy. Now what is the mechanism of greenhouse effect? The energy of the sun reaches the earth in the form of UV, visible and near IR radiation. Most of this passes through the atmosphere without being absorbed. Out of the total amount of energy available at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, about half the energy is absorbed by the Earth's surface and the rest is absorbed by the Earth's surface or reflected. The light reflected back by clouds does not affect the mechanism of greenhouse effect since it is lost to the system. The surface is warm, so it radiates far IR radiation with wavelengths longer than the absorbed radiation. There's a small overlap between the incident solar spectrum and the terrestrial thermal spectrum, but this is so small that it can be neglected. The atmosphere absorbs most of this thermal radiation and re-radiates it in both directions that is upwards and downwards. The surface of the earth absorbs the downward radiated portion. The earth's surface heated to a temperature around 255 Kelvin radiates long wavelength infrared heat ranging from 4 to 100 micrometer. At these wavelengths, greenhouse gases otherwise transparent to incoming solar radiation are more absorbent. Each layer of the Earth's atmosphere containing greenhouse gases absorbs some of the heat radiated from lower layers to upper layers. It re-radiates both upwards and downwards. In equilibrium, it radiates the same amount that has been absorbed by it. As the concentration of gases increases, amount of absorption and re-radiation also increases and ultimately results in the heating of layers of the atmosphere and the surface below. Infrared radiation can be absorbed and emitted by the greenhouse gases, including diatomic gases having two different atoms, such as CO, carbon monoxide, and all gases having three or more atoms, for example, nitrogen dioxide, methane, etc. It is estimated that approximately 99% of the dry atmosphere is IR inactive. This is because the main gases present, nitrogen, oxygen and argon, are not able to directly absorb or emit infrared radiation. The energy absorbed and emitted by the greenhouse gases can of course be shared between the gases which are IR inactive by intermolecular collisions. The greenhouse role of carbon dioxide has been much in the news recently. Since the beginning of the last century, the rate of increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide has increased by about 45 parts per million. The main reasons for increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are the following. Volcanoes. Some volcanoes emit carbon dioxide in large amounts. It is one of the most potent sources that add carbon dioxide naturally to the atmosphere. High concentration of carbon dioxide is found in the entire region around a volcano. Burning of fossil fuels. This is the major anthropogenic source. With the increase in population and escalation in industrial growth,
the demand for fossil fuels has greatly increased. It is estimated that for each ton of coal used, 0.693 tons of carbon is converted into carbon dioxide. For each ton of crude petroleum produced, 0.769 ton of carbon is delivered to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. Likewise, for each million cubic meters of natural gas, 524 tons of carbon are transformed into carbon dioxide. Levels of carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere in the future will depend on the continued use of fossil fuels. While the consumption in the developed countries is expected to remain essentially constant, the countries which are developing or underdeveloped are likely to use increasingly more fossil fuels as energy source. The third reason, deforestation. Plants use high amounts of atmospheric carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. As a result of deforestation, an important sink of carbon dioxide is being eliminated. There are two ways by which deforestation adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Firstly, most trees are either burned or decomposed by bacteria, directly adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Secondly, the land which is deforested is unable to act as a sink for carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. As a result of these two effects being combined, deforestation contributes 10 to 30 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions due to fossil fuels. Relative contribution of different gases to the greenhouse effect. We can have a look at the relative contribution of other gases. Carbon dioxide is not the only gas contributing to greenhouse effect and global warming. It is the major greenhouse gas, but there are other greenhouse gases such as methane, chlorofluorocarbons, nitrous oxide, tropospheric ozone and water vapor. You can see in the table given here the relative contribution of different gases to the greenhouse effect. The carbon dioxide gas contributes 50% of the greenhouse effect. Methane contributes about 19%. CFCs contribute 17%. Tropospheric ozone 8%. Nitrous oxide N2O 4%. And water vapor 2%. The concentration of these gases is increasing significantly each year due to various industrial and agricultural processes. The role of these greenhouse gases was realized effectively when it was found that the addition of one molecule of chlorofluorocarbon causes the same greenhouse effect as caused by 10 to the power 4 carbon dioxide molecules. Since the atmospheric levels are rising rapidly and each molecule of these gases absorbs more infrared radiation than carbon dioxide, so their combined greenhouse effect is almost equal to that of carbon dioxide. Let's have a look at the contribution by methane. At present, the atmospheric concentration of methane is about 1.8 ppm globally. Methane is released by several processes, action of anaerobic bacteria on rice paddies and wetlands, leakage from natural gas pipelines and coal mines, organic matter decomposing in landfills, and incomplete combustion of forest or range fires. Methane concentration is increasing by 1.5% per year. In recent years, the concentration of methane has tended to decline, possibly due to reduction in burning of biomass. Also, the depletion of stratospheric ozone has exposed the troposphere to a large dose of ultraviolet radiation. These have increased the concentration of hydroxyl radicals by photodissociation of water, which acts as a major sink for methane. Methane molecule plus the hydroxyl radical give water and methyl radical. Then the next in list is nitrous oxide. The present concentration of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere is about 0.31 parts per million. Nitrous oxide is mainly released by the action of microbes or nitrogenous fertilizers in the soil and the burning of biomass, fossil fuels and forests. Each year, the concentration of nitrous oxide is increasing by 0.2%. It contributes 4% of the total greenhouse effect. 
ozone. The tropospheric concentration of ozone is about 0.02 parts per million. Sources of ozone are reaction between hydrocarbons and nitrogen dioxide emitted from burning of fossil fuels, reaction between nitric oxide made by soil microbes and terpenes and other hydrocarbons released by trees, deforestation as tropical trees absorb ozone from the atmosphere, removal of forests thus reduces the uptake of ozone which is then added to the troposphere and burning of biomass. Fossil fuel burning also contributes to addition of ozone indirectly by emitting nitrogen dioxide as combustion product which in turn initiates ozone formation. The concentration of tropospheric ozone is increasing at the rate of 1% in the northern hemisphere. Tropospheric ozone contributes to an extent of about 8% to the greenhouse effect. We now come to the totally synthetic compounds, the chlorofluorocarbons. The chlorofluorocarbons, which mainly contribute to the greenhouse effect, are CFCl3 and CF2Cl2. Chlorofluorocarbons are used as solvents, refrigerants and spray can propellants. The rate of increase in chlorofluorocarbons is the fastest, 6% per year. Their contribution to the greenhouse effect is of the order of 17%. Consequences of the greenhouse effect have to be examined. Before the greenhouse gases started trapping the solar energy, the average temperature of the earth was minus 15 degrees Celsius. The greenhouse gases raised the earth's mean temperature to its present value of plus 15 degrees Celsius. Thus the most trivial consequence of the greenhouse effect of course is that without it our planet would have been uninhabitable. However, any further increase in the atmospheric levels of greenhouse gases must be stopped. Otherwise the increase in greenhouse effect would have adverse environmental implications. Let's have a look at all the effects of greenhouse effect. Effect of greenhouse effect on the global climate. If the present emission trends of greenhouse gases continues, a global warming of 3.5 degrees Celsius to 4.5 degrees Celsius is likely to occur. This may seem to be a small temperature change. However, records from the geological past indicate that Average global temperatures have varied over a range of no more than 2 degrees Celsius since the end of the last glaciation, which was around 10,000 years ago. In fact, the period 1550 to 1850 is sometimes termed as the Little Ice Age because this period saw extensive glacial advances in almost all alpine regions of the world. Global warming would have the following effects on global climate. Rise in sea level. The most serious outcome of global warming would be a rise in sea level. It has been estimated that the sea level may rise 0.5 to 1.5 meters in the next 50 to 100 years. The reason is heating of ocean water and melting of glaciers on mountains. The ice cap in East Antarctica is not expected to melt in the foreseeable future but the West Antarctica ice sheet which is partially in contact with ocean water may break up and melt causing the sea level to rise even more than 1.5 meters. Let's have a look at the higher sea level consequences. Of course there would be increase in the frequency and severity of floods. It would also damage coastal areas. It would cause loss of soil replenishment and cause seawater intrusion into river and other aquatic systems near the ocean. One third of the world population lives in low-lying coastal areas. A large part of the population of some countries is at risk if sea level rises substantially. For example, half the population of Bangladesh lives at an elevation of less than 5 meters. If present trends continue, Bangladesh will lose up to 18% of its habitable land by 2050. Likewise, a combination of sea level rise and loss of soil replenishment on the Nile Delta is expected to destroy 
as much as 19% of Egypt's arable land by the middle of this century. Of the 1196 islands comprising Maldives, almost all are at 3 meters height from sea level and many people live at the height of less than 2 meters. If the West Antarctica ice sheet begins to melt, the Pacific Ocean would rise to such dangerous levels that all the densely populated coastal cities from Shanghai to San Francisco would be threatened. If the Arctic ice cap begins to melt, then Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Siberia and Alaska would be adversely affected. Evaporation of water from aquatic systems. Global warming will cause more water to evaporate from the aquatic systems and create more water vapor. The extra water vapor, which is itself a greenhouse gas, will enhance the warming of the Earth's atmosphere. Changing patterns of rainfall. There will be large shifts in agricultural productive areas due to changes in rainfall patterns. Effects on plants. The increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will affect plant growth in several ways. These include carbon dioxide fertilization. At first glance, increase in concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere seems to be favorable for agricultural processes. A carbon dioxide rich environment is expected to enhance plant growth by accelerating the pace of photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, plants require carbon dioxide molecules and solar energy. The carbon dioxide diffuses into the plant through the stomata in the outer layer of leaf cells. The gas ultimately reaches the chloroplasts. These are the organelles in which photosynthesis takes place. Increased rate of photosynthesis due to increased concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been given the name carbon dioxide fertilization. Studies on wheat, moon bean and mustard indicate that plant biomass may increase by 25 to 30 percent because of carbon dioxide fertilization. Similar studies on citrus trees and cotton plants also show faster growth rates. Positive response to increased carbon dioxide levels in isolated laboratory experiments, however, do not necessarily translate into increased growth for the plants in natural environment. Competition for scarce resources limits the plant's response to higher levels of carbon dioxide. The requirements for fertilizers and biocides put the underdeveloped and developing nations at a disadvantage. For many countries, even water is a limited and expensive resource. Even if nutrients, light and water are present in abundance, it does not mean that the rate of photosynthesis would increase with increasing carbon dioxide concentration. Most plants record an increase in photosynthesis only initially. Later, this rate tends to fall and this may be due to one or both of the following reasons. The first reason, increased photosynthesis results in excess accumulation of starch in chloroplasts, thereby hindering the functioning of organelles. Second reason, in the presence of greater amount of carbon dioxide, a plant's ability to produce carbohydrates exceeds its ability to move the carbohydrates produced to actively growing parts of the plants, thus slowing down photosynthesis. Of course, such mechanisms do not operate in all plants. Where these are not applicable, enhanced carbon dioxide levels will increase the pace of photosynthesis. Such is the case with most herbs and weeds, but the higher yields of these are in no way beneficial to humanity. Lower nitrogen content. Dead plant material such as fallen leaves and twigs are rich in nitrogen. These act as natural fertilizers, providing nitrogen-based nutrients to the soil and thereby increasing soil productivity. However, plants grown in higher concentrations of carbon dioxide have less nitrogen and more carbon content. The litter of such plants, therefore, fail to increase soil fertility and nutrient cycling. Moreover, less nitrogen in plants means less protein content. In order to obtain enough nitrogen, 
insect pests feeding on carbon dioxide fertilized plants would eat more leaf this negates any benefit of crop yield boom in a carbon dioxide rich environment if at all such a boom occurs increased rate of decomposition as a result of increased global temperature due to greenhouse effect the rate of decomposition of dead plant matter and soil organic matter will increase the decomposition will yield more carbon dioxide adding to the greenhouse phenomenon increased threat of pests as a result of global warming farmers in temperate countries would be struggling with increased numbers of insecticide resistant pests for example the peach potato aphid mysis persicae a major agricultural pest feeding on the sap of potatoes and sugar beet has become more active in recent years it is resistant to virtually all the insecticides earlier the biggest challenge facing the aphids was to survive the winters aphids cannot move quickly when the temperature is low and so if they fall to the ground they die of starvation before getting back to their host plant now however global warming has removed that break on the growth of aphids that the winter had so far provided evaporation of water from soil due to increase in temperature the moisture content of soil would decrease and so would its fertility towards many crops effect on human health the global increase in the average temperature of the atmosphere is expected to increase the cases of infectious diseases which include malaria schistosomiasis sleeping sickness dengue and yellow fever the greenhouse effect will thus enhance the problem for the developing countries where these diseases are already more frequent global warming will increase the range of mosquitoes flies and snails the vectors that transmit infectious diseases the aedes aegypti mosquito which spreads dengue and yellow fever has extended its range in regions like costa rica colombia kenya and india due to the greenhouse effect likewise the outbreak of cholera in latin america in 1991 the outbreak of pneumonic plague in india in 1994 and the hantavirus epidemic in south america in 1994 can also be directly linked to global warming effects on wildlife greenhouse effect will seriously affect wildlife with every rise in temperature of 1 degree celsius plant and tree species will have to move about 90 kilometers towards the poles to survive many will simply not be able to spread fast enough the strain will be the greatest in higher latitudes because they will heat up fastest winter temperatures in latitudes between 60 degrees and 90 degrees are expected to warm up twice as fast as the global average and the arctic tundra may disappear altogether the change in patterns of rainfall will cause severe ecological damage and rise in sea level will affect the coastal habitats as species of trees and plants disappear the animals that depend on them will disappear as well as the average global temperature continues to increase there will be no place left for reestablishing these lost habitats so how do we mitigate global warming in recent years The international community has taken the change in climate and global warming due to greenhouse gases as a serious problem. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is the international body entrusted with assessing the science related to climate change. It was established in 1988 by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. in order to supply policy makers with regular assessments of the scientific basis of climate change its impacts and future dangers and options for adaptation and mitigation as well societies can respond to climate change by curtailing greenhouse gas emissions enhancing sinks and reservoirs too the capacity of societies to respond depends on the socio economic and environmental circumstances and availability of information 
as well as the required technology to the countries in question. A variety of policies and instruments are available to governments which provide incentives for mitigation action. Mitigation is essential to meet the objective of stabilizing the concentration of GH or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which has been set by the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the acronym being UNFCC, in their convention requires all parties, that is signatories, taking into account their responsibilities and capabilities to formulate and implement programs containing measures to mitigate climate change. Also requires all parties to develop and periodically update national inventories of GHG emissions and removals. Commits all parties to promote and cooperate in the development, application and diffusion of climate friendly technologies. Requires developed countries to adopt national policies and measures to limit GHG emissions and protect and enhance sinks and reservoirs. States that the extent to which developing countries will implement their commitments will depend on financial resources and transfer of technology. The UNFCC webpage on mitigation highlight a number of issues which are being addressed by parties under various convention bodies. Let us have a look at the phenomenon of acid rain which is also a global problem in recent times. Robert Angus Smith first coined the term acid rain in 1872 even though the phenomenon was known since 1853. Rainwater is naturally slightly acidic due to dissolved carbon dioxide. Acid rain is rain or any other form of precipitation such as snow, sleet, fog, dew etc. which is unusually acidic that is containing a higher concentration of hydrogen ions than normal rain. Acid rain looks like normal rain but its highly acidic nature makes it dangerous for the environment and for humans. The burning of fossil fuels, coal, gas and oil is responsible for the production of sulphur dioxide and nitrogen oxides which increase the acidity of rain or precipitation. Though these oxides are emitted into the atmosphere from natural sources as well such as volcanoes, oceans, biological decay and forest fires, their amounts have increased rapidly due to human activities such as combustion of fuels in power plants, factories and automobiles. Acid rain and acid precipitation depend upon the chemical nature of air pollutants and moisture in the atmosphere. The effects of acid rain on trees and freshwater bodies were first observed in Scandinavian countries during the 1970s and 1980s. This became a global problem when it was recognized that the source of the emissions may be far away from the place where the precipitation takes place. Let's have a look at the causes of acid rain. Chemical reactions in the atmosphere are responsible for acid rain as we have already mentioned. In this process, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide react with moisture to produce sulfuric and nitric acids respectively. The oxides can travel long distances and become a part of rain, sleet, snow, fog etc. many miles away as they are water soluble and can be easily carried by wind. Normal mildly acidic rain is neutralized by alkaline chemicals in the air. Soil, bedrock, lakes and streams also have certain alkaline chemicals which neutralize mildly acidic normal rain. Acid rain however may be too acidic to be neutralized in this way. Over a period of time these neutralizing materials can be washed away by acid rain. Damage to crops, trees, lakes, rivers and animals can result. Types of acid rain or deposition. Acid rain deposition can be categorized into two parts. There could be wet deposition. In wet areas, acid falls with rain, sleet, hail, snow and fog. There could also be dry deposition. This refers to acidic gases and particles which get deposited on soil, 
vegetation and water on the earth's surface. The pH scale is used for the measurement of rain acidity. As is well known, the pH scale is from 0 to 14, in which 0 to 6 is acidic region, while 8 to 14 is basic region and pH 7 is neutral. Normal rain has a pH of between 5 to 5.5, while typical acid rain has a pH as low as 4. The chemical reactions involved in the formation of acid rain can, have, can be studied. Nitric oxide reacts with oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen dioxide further dissolves in water to form nitric acid which is washed down as acid rain. However, this is the smaller component of acid rain. Two molecules of nitric oxide, NO, combine with one molecule of oxygen to give two molecules of nitrogen dioxide which then further react with a molecule of water to give a mixture of nitrous and nitric acids, HNO2 and HNO3. The major part of acid rain is sulfuric acid. This is formed by the reaction of sulfur dioxide with oxygen to form sulfur trioxide, which further dissolves in water to produce sulfuric acid. Sulfur dioxide, gaseous, reacts with half a molecule of oxygen, gaseous again, and gives a gas sulfur trioxide SO3. Sulfur trioxide then reacts with water to give sulfuric acid H2SO4. Air pollution thus we see plays a huge role in acid rain as air is the medium in which pollutants released combine with rainwater or atmospheric moisture and are washed down to the surface of the earth. Effects of acid rain the types of effects can be looked at in this way, two kinds of effects, chronic and episodic. Chronic effect of acid rain is the effect of years of acid rain. Water alkalinity is reduced by long periods of acid rain and resulting in reduction of nutrients such as calcium. In an aquatic ecosystem, the plants and animals may develop weakness due to imbalance in nutrients. On the other hand, episodic effect is the immediate effect of acid rain. Acidity of water in water bodies may be increased suddenly by this effect. A heavy rainstorm is an example of an episodic effect. Acid rain episodes may cause sudden changes in water chemistry by increasing levels of toxic substances such as aluminium. Effect on living organisms, materials and the environment. Acid rain increases the acidity of soil, rivers, lakes and streams which can lead to the following consequences. Soil becomes acidic affecting the growth of trees, plants and crops. Water bodies which become too acidic are unfit to support healthy aquatic ecosystems since some acid intolerant species may perish or move away thus changing species distribution. Acid rain leaches normally insoluble minerals from soil and rocks and adds them to water bodies, increasing their hardness and toxicity of the water present due to added calcium, magnesium, aluminium, etc. Aluminium nitrate or sulfate formed by the reaction of aluminium minerals with acid rain are soluble and thus ready for uptake by plants. Such water becomes unfit for irrigation and consumption by humans, domestic animals and wildlife. Acid deposition as particles of nitrate and sulfate can be carried deep into the lungs with respiration, causing respiratory and cardiac illness and aggravating conditions such as asthma and bronchitis. Acid rain and acid deposition also cause buildings and monuments to deteriorate. Many buildings and statues of historical importance are built with stone such as marble which contains calcium carbonate. Sulfuric acid in acid rain converts calcium carbonate into calcium sulfate which can cause discoloration and pitting of the stone. The yellowing of the Taj Mahal, earlier famous for its pure white marble structure, is an example of this phenomenon. Corrosion of metal structures like bridges is also accelerated by high acidity of rain. Prevention of acid rain. 
in view of the far reaching effects of acid rain it is important to take steps to mitigate this phenomenon some preventive steps can be curtailing the use of fossil fuels by simple steps like more walking and cycling instead of driving switching to low sulfur coal desulfurization of coal before burning removing sulfur oxides from waste gases coming out of chimney stacks road traffic restriction bringing more renewable energy sources such as solar wind and geothermal into use use of battery operated and fuel efficient vehicles etc let us summarize what we have learned till now we have discussed about greenhouse gases which result in the altering of global temperature and are hence responsible for global warming greenhouse effect is the excessive warming of the atmosphere due to the absorption of long wavelength radiation followed by re-radiation by gases such as carbon dioxide water vapor methane and nitrous oxide due to high anthropogenic concentration of greenhouse gases the atmosphere is overheating and inducing a global warming phenomenon this overheating is causing glaciers to melt rise in sea level and deterioration of plant and animal life greenhouse effect can be slowed down by lowering emissions of greenhouse gases acid rain is another such global phenomenon which is caused by the pollutant gases sulfur and nitrogen oxides these gases produce acids with rain and atmospheric water vapor which precipitate on earth as acid rain and acid deposition the main sources are the emissions of oxides of sulfur and nitrogen from industries and automobiles we have also had a look at the mitigation measures like use of renewable energy sources low fossil fuel burning etc that can reduce both the greenhouse effect and acid rain